Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from comments on the videos that I post on Odyssey and on YouTube. Sometimes these questions and comments come through social media such as Mastodon, Reddit, sometimes through email. And the very first question I want to respond to is, Hey DT, you say you don't care if people use free software or proprietary software, that everyone makes their own choices in this regard but you talk about the free software philosophy all the time on your videos. How does that make sense? And I can kind of see why this is confusing to some people because I talk about the benefits of free and open source software versus proprietary closed source software all the time on my videos. And the reason is, is because that's a choice I've made and I want people to know that there are benefits. Like it's, it's very clear benefits why you would use free software versus proprietary software. You know, th there's certain differences. There's tangible differences between free software and proprietary software. And I want people to know the differences in those two different areas. And I want people to actually know that free and open source software actually exists because many people have never heard about it, right? It's a topic that most standard computer users, you know, people that are not nerds, just your average desktop computer user, for example, has never heard the free software philosophy. And I want to tell people about it, right? I, I just want to provide some some information. I want to shed some light on a topic that most people have have no knowledge of at all. That way people can make better informed decisions. If I tell you about free and open source software versus proprietary software, if you hear that message and you understand it and then you decide, okay, I've heard everything you said about free and open source software, DT, but you know what? I don't care. I, I don't care about that at all. I'm just going to keep using all the proprietary software that I like because honestly, uh, I just, I, I don't care about the free software movement. Okay. That's your decision. I respect that. I have no problems with that. Uh, I, I don't take it personally. I hope you don't take personally, you know, the software decisions that I make or any decision I make in life. We all make our own decisions on what we do with our own lives. One of the things when you're making any decisions in life, uh, so many times there's actually a right decision and a wrong decision, a good decision, evil decision. You know, you know, Everything is kind of black and white for the most part. So many decisions, they either benefit you or they harm you in some way. And, you know, when you're making these decisions, if you're better informed on the topic at hand, you're much more likely to make the better decision for you personally. And when you really think about this idea of making decisions in in the light or in the dark, right? <laughs> Imagine you are totally ignorant to the whole idea of free software versus proprietary software. And maybe you make the right decision in my eyes where you're you're using a lot of free software because just by accident. You don't know anything about free versus proprietary software. You, all you know is software. You don't know free versus proprietary, but you just happen to be using free software. You've never heard the message. Is that a good thing? Well, in my mind, no, that's not a good thing. You made, I guess, the right decision as far as the one I would have made, but you're not aware that that was the right decision. You're totally ignorant. You're totally blind to the fact that you even made a decision because really you didn't make a decision. It was all happenstance. It, it was all accident that you even arrived at the decision you did. And conversely, if you're making a wrong decision, but you're in the light, you're educated on the topic. You, you know about free software versus proprietary, but maybe you make the wrong decision in my eyes where you're, you know, I'll just use proprietary software. Well, at least you're educated on the topic, right? You made an informed decision and maybe you know enough that one day you'll actually realize, hey, you know what? That decision that I made, that might have been the wrong decision and you can correct it. Having more information is always better. And that's all I'm trying to do with the message of free and open source software versus proprietary software. I just want people to be aware that that choice, that freedom is out there. And, and I want people to be able to make a decision for themselves based on that knowledge. Moving on to the next question. Hey, DT, do you have a video showing how to best set up a window manager so that it doesn't automatically shut off the monitors after 10 minutes? I've been searching far and wide for an explanation that works, but nothing seems to work. On startup, I mean, I know how to do it manually. Okay, well, I mean, that's what I was going to suggest. If you know how to do it manually, you use the X set command if you're using a XORG window manager, which 99% of the window managers out there 
using X11, right? So you would, for example, to turn off DPMS, which is the uh, display power management system, you would exit minus DPMS, and that turns it off. Or if you wanted to turn it on, exit plus DPMS would turn it back on. If you want to turn off your screensaver, exit S off. So screensaver off, right? Um, if you want to set a specific amount of time for the inactivity to kick in, you could do X set S and something like 3600 space 3600. Those are seconds. So in an hour, then the inactivity would kick in and your screen would, would go blank. Now in your message, you mentioned you know how to do it manually. So you probably know some of the commands that I just told you about. So if you know the commands, then if you're using a, a window manager, a window manager is going to have a config file somewhere. In that config file, there's probably a section for auto starting programs. Um, just add those commands, those commands to turn off DPMS and to turn off the screensaver. Add that to your window manager config, and then you never have to enter those manually. Every time you log into that window manager, those commands automatically run and you're set. And the next question comes from the video I recently did on Whiptail. Whiptail is kind of like dialogue, you know, dialogue boxes, kind of like in curses, uh, dialogue boxes that you can use with your bash scripting. And this person writes, hey, DT, why don't you use printf for ensuring the right amount of spaces? That for loop you used is actually ridiculous. And he's right. <laughs> So one of the things with my scripting videos, my programming videos, I never really spend a lot of time trying to write the best code, the, the most optimized code, especially on my videos. Sometimes I like to do things kind of hacky, kind of janky. And the way I was adding those spaces to the, uh, to the whip tail boxes, I knew that it was ridiculous. I knew there was better ways, but I was doing it in a hurry. A lot of times these scripts, I don't spend much time on. I write them rather quickly. I have a real world problem I want to solve and I just write a script and the script works. There's nothing wrong with it. Could the code be improved? Yes. And I, I leave it like that because it sparks conversation in the comment section of the video. And obviously that's good for the video. That's good for the channel, that conversation, but it's also good or the general community. And a lot of times what ends up happening is on these scripting videos, these programming videos that I sometimes do is the comments section has so much fantastic information, you know, because people are posting all of these solutions for these problems. They're, they're doing these rewrites. They're refactoring the code for me in the comments section, you know, and it's, it's really, in a lot of ways, the comments section on some of these scripting videos I do is better than the video that I made as far the information in the video I made is good information, but you'll find 10 times the amount of information in the comment section from that conversation that gets sparked sometimes by me doing some of these, you know, less than ideal uh, situations like that for loop, that ridiculous for loop I was using in, in that case of the script. Uh, I won't say that necessarily I troll you guys sometimes doing that stuff because it wasn't a troll job. I mean, I, I legitimately wrote the for loop thinking it would work. But after I wrote it, like I immediately after I wrote it, I know uh, this is kind of janky. This is hacky. But I was like, should I rewrite this? I was like, no, I'm going to leave it in the video because I knew again that you guys would help me out and, and it was really good. Now, as far as the whip tail boxes, as far as the script itself that I eventually implemented whip tail into, it doesn't use that ridiculous for loop. But I've implemented a much better way of achieving those spaces. But again, uh, for video purposes, sometimes I like to spark that conversation by doing things that I know people are going to, you know, correct me on. Moving on to the next question. Hey, DT, can you do this for alacrity? And what he was specifically asking is, can he add things like NeoFetch? Uh, the power line effect as far as I like, like bash power line I think I was using in this video it's an older video that this comment came from uh, the shell color scripts I, because in that older video I think I was using either the ST terminal or maybe URX VT and of course this person that commented he's using the alacrity terminal which is what I'm using now I've been using alacrity for the last two years and he's like, was all this work in alacrity yeah so one of the things and, and I get these kinds of questions about a lot of terminal stuff that I do 
is there a difference between all of these terminals, Alacrity and ST and URSVT and whatever, the GNOME terminal, the XFCE terminal, console with a K, you know, what's the difference? You know, I, I see you, you've got all these fancy effects, you know, the, with the shell color scripts and the random uh, whiz bang effects and power line effects. And now I'm using the star shield prompt and do they all work in every terminal? For the most part, everything you see in my terminal would work in whatever terminal emulator you use because all terminal emulators are essentially the same thing. All they do is display text. It is a text-based interface. That's all they do. They display text and they all do that. Now some of them do it a little better than others. Like if you're using weird characters, uh, weird Unicode characters, weird glyphs, uh, you know, uh, drawing boxes and things like that and certain uh, mathematical symbols, some terminal emulators are really bad at supporting some of those strange Unicode characters. Oddly enough, URXVT is terrible at displaying a lot of those weird Unicode glyphs. Xterm also has some issues. It's, it's not as bad as URXVT, but it's pretty bad. ST actually is really good at displaying Unicode, uh, and Alacrity is, is amazing. As far as there's very little I've come across that Alacrity didn't display correctly as far as a text based environment. Moving on. Hey, DT, can you review FreeDOS? Um, you know, I ha this is the first time I think anybody's ever asked me about FreeDOS because I don't think that many people have a use case for it. And the reason I've never reviewed it and probably will never review it, I don't have a use case for FreeDOS. I, I can't think of any reason why anyone would use FreeDOS, the, the only legitimate use case for that operating system that I can think of would be if you want to run some legacy DOS games. And by legacy, I mean, we're talking about 40-year-old games, right? <laughs> legacy DOS-only games. So that's really, yeah, I, I, I don't know what, what I would do with that operating system. I don't know what you would do with that operating system. Like, I, I really... I, I kind of I get sometimes get these comments and I sometimes wish you guys when you ask me, hey, would you try out this particular operating system or this piece of software and this text editor or whatever? Um, sometimes if you ask me these questions, I, I tell me what you want out of this. Right? Like why why are you interested in free DOS? I'd like to know what you think you could get out of it, because that might help me understand what we're even talking about here. And the next question comes from a recent video I did about getting Polybar working inside Xmonad. And uh, in my Polybar config for Xmonad, Polybar doesn't work right with Xmonad. It, it's just, it, it, there's a, a bug, there's some issues with it, the way it displays workspaces, it displays workspaces all out of order, jumbled up it, on, on different monitors. It'll have different orders for all the workspaces. It, it's a mess. And he writes, hey, DT, do you have pin workspaces in the Polybar config set to false? That may fix it. I don't have that set to false in my config. And the reason is setting it to false makes it a worse situation than what it actually is. <laughs> so if I set the Polybar config and to pin workspaces set to false, what it does is now I, it displays all the workspaces on all the monitors, but each set of workspaces on all three of my monitors are out of order. So I've got all nine workspaces on Polybar, but on each monitor, they're displayed in a different order. That's confusing. That's extremely confusing. Like I, I, I can't work with that, right? Especially people using my configs, they're not going to know like what each workspace is set to a number, right? Super one, super two, super three. But if they're all jumbled up out of order, you don't know the number you'd have to hit the key to actually switch to that workspace. That's an issue. So I actually set pin workspaces to true. And that's a little weird, but at least you don't get confused as far as what workspace you're on and what order they're in. Because now what it does is the monitors, the monitor that has focus shows all the workspaces in the correct order. Now the monitors that don't have focus, they only show one workspace and that's the workspace that they're currently on. And that's okay. Like it, it's not the way Xmonad and Xmobar, it's not, not the way I'm used to it, but it works. It's not, again, it's not ideal, but it works. But setting pin workspaces to false actually breaks things in, in a much more serious way. And this is a known issue with Xmonad with Polybar and the Xmonad guys are actually trying to fix it. I think they've actually already patched it in fact, but the patch 
is for the next major version of X Monad, which who knows when that will be released. A few months from now, maybe a year from now. I know when the last major version of X Monad got released, uh, 0.17, it was released well over a year ago, but it didn't appear in Arch Linux until just a few months back. Like we waited, I think, like nine or 10 months after the official release of X Monad 0.17 before it actually hit the Arch repos. And that's probably what's going to happen with the you know 0.18 or whatever the next major version is. It's probably going to be released, and then for whatever reason, Arch really lags behind, especially on Haskell stuff. It may be a year, a year and a half before the patch version that actually makes Xmonad work correctly with Polybar finally hits the repos. Moving on to the next question. Hey DT, I installed Arch Linux and on top of it, I installed DTOS. By default, my machine now has Nuvo drivers, but I need CUDA to mine crypto. So I needed to install the NVIDIA drivers, but then as expected, things didn't go well. It's always a pain in the tuchus to install graphics card drivers. Can you make a video on how to remove Nuvo drivers and install the NVIDIA drivers? So I'm not going to make a video about it necessarily, but I will tell you exactly what to do uh, right now because on every machine I've ever had that had an NVIDIA card on Arch Linux, on any Arch Linux based distribution, all you need to do is install the NVIDIA package. So if you're using the regular Linux kernel, then install NVIDIA, the package NVIDIA, and reboot the machine and it should automatically default to using the proprietary NVIDIA driver rather than the Nuvo driver. That's all you need to do. If you're using the LTS kernel, so if you installed Linux-LTS for the kernel, you need to install a NVIDIA-LTS driver. So the regular NVIDIA driver doesn't work with the LTS kernel and vice versa. So make sure if you're on the LTS kernel, do NVIDIA-LTS for the driver. Um, there's also a NVIDIA-Utils package that you probably want to install and you mentioned CUDA. CUDA is a separate package, I believe, in the Arch repos. I believe it's in the standard repos just as CUDA. And really, once you install the right driver, just reboot the machine. Um, you didn't give me a lot of information. You said you installed the NVIDIA drivers, but then things didn't go well. But then you, did, you didn't tell me what didn't go well. Like, did you reboot and get a black screen? Because that will happen if you didn't install the right NVIDIA driver. For example, if you were using the LTS kernel, but you didn't install the LTS NVIDIA driver, you'll reboot and get a black screen. Not a problem. Drop to a TTY, install the right NVIDIA driver, NVIDIA LTS in this case, reboot. Everything should work again. The next question is actually really a comment. Hey DT, I'm just letting you know that I will never use a window manager because I'm very happy with GNOME. This, however, will not deter me from watching your awesome videos. Cheers. And that was a video I did about configuring OpenBox. And well, well, thank you for watching the videos. I appreciate the kind words saying they're awesome videos. And I understand, hey, if GNOME is working for you and, and you love the GNOME desktop environment, Keep using it. As I stated earlier in the video, we all make our own choices as far as the software we use. And if GNOME's working for you, keep rocking it. And the final question is one I've gotten a lot. And I do need to address this in some detail. So let's get into it. Hey DT, what makes you stick with DTOS being a build script to be run on an existing Arch installation as opposed to an actual full Linux distribution with a Calamaris installer? But one of the things when I initially made this post installation script for DTOS, I had a couple of reasons why I didn't want to build a proper ISO and use the Calamaris installer. The first one is I didn't want DTOS to actually be recognized as our real Linux distribution. I, I didn't want to be responsible for an actual Linux distribution because if I'm if it's a real Linux distribution, then every single problem on that distribution. So if you install DTOS, the distribution, right? Any issue you have, you're going to come to me with it. I don't have time. I don't have time with it, right? So that was originally the reason I can't be the lead dev or the lead maintainer of a Linux distribution. I, I've got too much other stuff on my plate, right? I make videos about Linux. That's my job. That's what I enjoy. And that's what you guys enjoy. I'm assuming that's why you guys watch my content. Do you want me to shut down my YouTube channel and just maintain a Linux distribution? I don't think most of you would want that. And I know I wouldn't want that. So that was one of the two main reasons why I wrote DTOS the way I did as being a post installation script rather than just building a proper ISO. The second reason I did it is I actually think, and this has been something I've talked about in the past on camera, but I really think we have 
too many Linux distributions out there. Um, many of them do the same thing. Many of them don't necessarily have to build their own ISOs. So many Linux distributions out there could do exactly what I'm doing with DTOS. Hey, just run this post installation script that adds some repositories to your pacman.conf and then you know run the a, a package install list right where it installs a bunch of packages from now the DTOS core repository that's on your system you reboot the machine voila you've got DTOS right most Linux distributions could do this most Arch Linux based distributions could do exactly what I do with that DTOS script without needing to build an ISO and fool with the Calamari's installer and and to be honest I think it would make sense for people to do that. I know kind of why they don't. It would cause headaches. Honestly, the way I do DTOS, being a post installation script rather than its own ISO, it actually causes me a lot more headaches doing it that way than it does if I would just build an ISO. Because now I'm responsible for DTOS, how it runs when you install it on top of Arch Linux, for example or Manjaro, or Arco, or Endeavor, or the hundred other Arch Linux-based distributions that are all doing their own unique things. You know, that's very hard to write a, a post-installation script like DTOS that will work on all 100 of those Arch Linux-based distributions. It's very difficult. Where if I didn't do that, if I just built my own ISO, I wouldn't have to fool with any of that. But I'm going to keep DTOS as a post-installation script because I do think... I, I do wish more distributions just did things this way because I could envision a world where instead of everybody just building their own ISOs, you just add your own repo, right? And you just add a repo and there you go. You, you've got your new distro. And I, I think that's a, a smarter way to go. And I see, I, I see other people coming around to that idea as well because at least scripts I see a lot of them especially on Arch Linux there's so many Arch Linux installation scripts out there that try to automate the process for installing Arch especially you know before Arch had its little easy installer now what is it the uh, Arch dash install ultimately is is there a right way or a wrong way to do this I mean doing the post installation script or just building an ISO there's pros and cons to each um, and that's for me. There's pros and cons to each. Now, for you, the end user, I really don't think there's really not a lot of pros and cons for you because you're going to end up with the same thing. I mean, yeah, with DTOS, you don't have a Calamaris installer, right? You don't download an ISO and just run through the Calamaris installer. Okay, just download Manjaro, right? It's the same thing. Download Manjaro, run through their Calamaris installer, and when you're done, you know, get clone DTOS and then run the DTOS script and, you know, just let that run for about 10 minutes, reboot, and you got DTOS. So for the end user, it really doesn't add any pain points to you. For me, uh, the pros and cons kind of outweigh each other. I, I mean, I could do it either way. I've chosen this way for now, and it's working. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. I need to thank... Gabe, James, Maxim, Matt, Mehmet, Mitchell, Paul, Royal, Wes, Armor Dragon, Bash Potato, Chuck, Commander Angry, George, Lee, Methos, Nate, Ur, Jan, Paul, Peace Archer, Dora, Polytech, Reality, Spreadless, Red Prophet, Roland, Tools, Devler, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this Hey DT episode would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm sponsored by you guys, the community. If you like my work, want to see more videos about Linux and free and open source software, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. Peace.